Grace, mercy, and peace are yours. We've got our Father through our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. The word of God that we're going to look at today as we see how promises kept brings joy to God's people is uh, our gospel from Luke chapter 1, the song of Zechariah. It's, if you have a service folder and want to follow along, it's on page 5 in your service folder. In Christ, dear fellow redeemed. Today we focus on how promises kept bring joy to God's people, but when you think about it, promises that aren't kept have the exact opposite effect, right? One thing I've tried to be careful to do over my years in the ministry is not make promises that God hasn't made when I'm ministering to people, not point people to promises that God didn't make. Because quite often when, I, when I'm visiting people, let's say in the hospital, and they're dealing with a health issue of some sort, a lot of people will, will talk to them and say, everything's going to be all right, I know everything's going to be all right, trying to be positive and encourage them, I understand that. But I try never to say, everything's going to be all right. Because I don't know that. I can't speak that as a promise, as God's representative, as a pastor, and say, I'm sure everything will be okay, and then it's not, and then that quite possibly is going to cast doubt on all the other promises I point you to. So one of the things I've always tried to do is say, I don't know what the future is going to bring with, with whatever it is that you're dealing with, let's say. But I do know this as a certainty, God will be with you and he loves you and he'll be by your side as you go through everything. Now, that's a promise I know God will keep, so I can point people to that promise. But uh, if I start making promises that God hasn't made and I break them, and speaking for God, that's a problem for God's people and in our ministry. So today we, we, we take a look at how important it is that we can speak promises that God has spoken because all of his promises are yes in Jesus. That's, you know, what we heard in our, in our readings today. He promised that he would establish David's throne forever. He sent Jesus and put him on uh, God, David's throne forever. He is the exact representation of, of the Father. He is the one who has done all these things for us. Zechariah points uh, the people around him to a promise that was kept that God would establish David's throne forever and provide redemption for God's people in the, the song of Zechariah. I don't know if you remember Zechariah. Married to Elizabeth, father of John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, priest serving in the temple. God sent a messenger to him, made a promise to him. You're going to have a son. Told him who the son would be and what he would do. Zechariah didn't believe it. So for the nine months until John the Baptist was born, Zechariah couldn't talk. He was mute that whole time. As a reminder, he had not believed God's promise to him. Where we picked up the song of Zechariah is that uh, John the Baptist had just been born. They wanted to name him, and Elizabeth said his name's going to be John, and they thought, that's, that's not right, there isn't anyone named John in there, but that's the name that they were supposed to give him. And so he takes a tablet when they ask him, and he writes on it, his name is John. And then he could start talking again. So after nine months of not being able to talk, what, the first things that we know of that are, came out of his mouth is this song of praise. He didn't ask where the remote was, he talked about God. This is what was on his heart. And you look at this song of praise. It's all joy because God kept his promise. Because God provided redemption. Because God raised up a horn of salvation. Horn was in the Bible is always a symbol of strength. He, he had raised up a powerful savior. And you notice he talks about it as an accomplished fact. Who, would, who has provided redemption for his people. You understand at this point in time Jesus hasn't been born yet? He's still in Mary's womb, Nazareth, I suppose, I suppose. He speaks of it as an accomplished fact. So great is his trust now in God's promises. And we're told that right before this, he prophesied. He was moved by the Spirit to sing this song of praise, to talk about who God is and what God has done and the effect it has on God's people. He provides redemption. He sets us free from the slavery to sin so that we have a whole new kind of slavery. <coughs> 
a slavery to righteousness, as it talks about in Paul's letters all the time. That now we are set free from sin, death, and the power of the devil, but we're also set free for something, which he talks about in there as well. See, the joy that, that God's people have because of this service that's been given to them by God keeping his promises is a joy that isn't expressed only in words or in a song like Zechariah or in hymns like we sing. This, sir, this joy is expressed, as we're told in here, uh, rescue us from the hand of our enemies and to enable us to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. God's people are set free from the control of sin, the, the guilt of sin, the punishment that sin deserves, not so that they just go and do whatever they want, but so that they serve the God who has set them free, so that they live in thanksgiving and joy that God has taken away from them the burden of being perfect on their own. This is the redemption he has provided. The holiness that God demanded of you and me and everyone else in all the world, Jesus provided through his perfect life. The punishment that our sins deserved, eternal life, or eternal death in hell, Jesus endured on the cross for us. This is the redemption that he has provided, as, as Zachariah said, even though it hadn't happened yet. You and I know it's happened. You and I have seen with our eyes the, the reason why the baby was born in Bethlehem. You and I have seen the reason why was we've seen him with the eyes of faith on the cross. We have seen the empty tomb. We have seen all the things our God has done for us so that we no longer live under the, the, this burden of keeping the law. Now we're set free to serve. Now we look at the law not as an obligation, something we have to do. Now we look at it as God tells me this is going to bring me joy. He's never lied to me before, so I'm going to do what he wants me to do. I'm going to serve him, not out of obligation, but out of thankfulness. I'm going to live to his glory and do the things he wants me to do. Problem is, you and I have a sinful nature. We hear we've been set free, and we don't hear the to serve part. Or our sinful nature switches it to, to uh, we've been set free to be served. That other people need to meet my needs. This is what we've been looking at, the Here We Stand Bible study. It's what we'll focus on today. Luther talked about it over and over, how we have been set free from the obligation of the law so that we can serve. We are free, not under the obligations of law, but we are slaves to everyone. We are to live to serve others. And in that service, there is joy when we do it out of love for Jesus. But if we slip back into doing it out of obligation or thinking that we have to, we miss the whole purpose of what God has set us free for. God has been a blessing to us so that he can be a blessing through us to other people. God has encouraged us with the message of the gospel so that we can encourage other people with the message of the gospel. God has given us word and sacrament to build us up and strengthen us so that we can be prepared for works of service which God has prepared in advance for us to do, like it says in Ephesians 2. Don't let your sinful nature say, I don't have to do anything to be saved. You don't. As, don't let that become an excuse for not living the way God wants you to and living for others and not just yourself. This is the nature of being a disciple of Christ. Because he has set us free, we understand we are free to serve others. And when we focus on God and his love and this redemption he has he has won for us in this joy he has brought to the whole world by keeping all of his promises, this service becomes a joy for us. It becomes something that is uh, incredibly valuable and, and, and treasured by God's people. This morning I got up early and I was watching a sports center. And uh, Kraken. You know who the Kraken are? The new Seattle hockey team? That's right. Your state doesn't have a pro hockey team. You guys probably don't follow it. But Seattle Kraken, I think it was the Canucks. They were playing the Canucks, and there was someone right behind the visitor's bench that was is studying to be a doctor. And 
they noticed on, the, it was an assistant equipment manager or something like that, I don't remember his title, a mole growing on the back of his neck, and they thought it was cancerous. So they tried banging on the, the glass to get his attention to tell him, and of course everyone bangs on the glass, he didn't pay any attention to that. So finally they took, she took her phone, wrote on there, you have a mole on the back of your neck that's cancerous, please go see a doctor and get it checked out. And she held it up there until someone finally saw it and told him, and he eventually went and saw it, and it was cancerous. And the doctor said if that, and he didn't even know he had a mole there, said if you wouldn't have come and seen me four or five years, you'd have, you wouldn't be here. So they talked about how now Vancouver was back in Seattle, and they got to meet each other, and that was kind of cool to watch and all of that stuff. And then it was kind of cool that they, uh, Vancouver and uh, the Kraken, the two teams together, gave a $10,000 scholarship to her as she continues her medical training. <clears throat> kind of a neat story to see in the morning. I, I really enjoyed it. Do you understand that your service to God is along the same lines? You've been called by God to save lives, not just for time, but for eternity. To share the gospel of Jesus Christ with one another, to encourage one another, to hold up to each other the message of the gospel. I don't care if you do it on your phone or in your voice or how you do it, but to, to point people to Jesus. And you don't do it. She didn't do it because she thought she was going to get a scholarship. She just did it because she was concerned for this person, I'm sure. You and I do it not because we're going to get something from God. We do it because we want to love the people God has loved. We want to share the gospel that brings life with the people that don't know it. We want to share the gospel that brings life to those who are straying away from it. We want to share the gospel who brings life to those who treasure it but are going through hard times. We want to share the gospel that brings life with all people at all times. More Jesus to more people more often. That's why we exist as Christians and as a congregation. And we've already received the greatest gift. Redemption from the guilt of our sins and the assurance that tonight, if you go home and lay your head on the pillow and you don't wake up tomorrow, it's okay. You're going to be in heaven. That's a certainty through the life and death of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>